everyone. I'm Kaushiki Sanhare from the Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry, and I welcome you here today at the day two of the Young Professionals Forum, Leadership in Times of Transition, that is being conducted by Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry in association with Knowledge Partner PCT. We will commence with the session on energy transition. And for this session, we have with us today, Mr. Vipul Tuli, MD Semkov, Mr. Mahesh Kohli, CEO Greenco, Ms. Vartika Shukla, Director Technical EIL, Mr. Mahip Jain, Executive Director Eversource Capital, and Dr. R.K. Malhotra, Director General Pippi. This session will be moderated by Mr. Vishal Mehta, BCG. Vishal, I will now request you to take this forward. Thank you, Kaushiki. And a warm welcome to all the audience and, and, and the panelists. I think on this um, interesting and exciting topic, uh, which in most of the sessions are being really hotly debated on whether the energy transition is, is real and at what pace it is going and how much is it required. Uh, you know, as I was preparing for this, this session, um, a very, I came across a very interesting video on, on my Twitter timeline, which was about a gentleman in US uh, driving his Tesla and then he ran out of charge. And then he you know, goes back and opens his boot and takes out a diesel can, fills up his Honda DG set and uses that to charge his car, right? So those are the kind of times that, that we are living in. You know, it's a really outrageously funny and instructive video. Uh, you know, should all look it up. But those are the times we are living in as we are transitioning, um, uh, you know, from, on multiple sources. Um, we see a lot of transitions in today, uh, from oil to gas, from oil to electric, uh, from coal to renewables, uh, you know, the big debate between uh, electric and hydrogen. Uh, so there are many, many debates going on in this area um, and, and trends which are uncovering. So I think it's one of the most exciting times to be in the, in the field of energy. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a very good report from UBS in, in January this year, which basically drew the parallels between the convergence in telecom to the convergence in the energy industry and, and said the big telecom giants which were caught off guard uh, something similar is, is likely to happen in, in the world of energy. Uh, though the convergence they were talking about was more from, from oil utility. Um, and as they looked at many investments being made by oil players in renewables and, and vice versa. Um, so I have, you know, without much ado, I would like to go to the, the panelists uh, who are all, um, you know, accomplished and, and learned people in their respective fields. Um, I would like to go first to Dr. Malhotra. Uh, uh, Dr. Malhotra, just help us decipher the hype from the reality. From you know, from your position, uh, what do you see are the trends which are playing out with respect to energy transition? What do you see as the real ones? And what do you see as, as more of hype uh, that gets talked about? You know, uh, Vishal, uh... Uh, this question is very important. First, let me compliment you that you, you talked about that Tesla being car. You know, in fact, there was a video which was circulated in Indian, uh, you know, social media also about an electric bus being charged by a generator, you know, a, DG, a diesel generator. So, uh, if we are talking about those kind of transitions to clean up the city and to reduce the carbon dioxide uh, emissions, I think uh, then we are not going the right way. Now, coming back to your question, which you have asked me about the reality and the hype, etc. I personally believe that we have always been under transition, you know, it is not something new. But everybody has started talking about energy transition these days. You know, uh, the, the mankind first uh, was using wood, then we started using, I remember my younger days when I was a child, you know, we were cooking with coal in our homes, you know, then uh, we started natural, uh, you know, uh, this LPG. So, we have moved from coal, uh, wood to coal, coal to oil, and then now oil to natural gas. And the natural transition will be to hydrogen also, which will be carbon free. So in a way, we are reducing carbon in our fuel all through, uh, which is required because we have to take care of the uh, climate uh, change issue and the concern, which is a very serious concern if we have to save this planet. Having said that, but what is the way we should go about? That's the question, you know, whether it is uh, all electric or whether it should be hydrogen fuel cells or whether it should be total ban on petrol diesel or, or the fossil fuels. I think these are the questions which we need to debate, uh, you know, uh, and we have to also see that there are aspirations of the middle class in uh, 
in countries like india where the uh, where the energy demand is bound to grow you know we will uh, never be able to meet our entire energy demand through renewables uh, although renewables uh, are growing and they need to grow uh, no doubt about it but we will have to continue to depend on fossil sources but can we make them clean can we use them more cleaner way that's the that that's that is the condition we should be talking about i like this statement you know at, at uh, uh, which uh, uh, mr mukesh ambani made recently he said we should not confuse between clean and unclean and if you can you know fix this carbon and convert it into you know when you are producing uh, fossil uh, from oil you are producing your petrol diesel or you are using it if you can somehow take care of the carbon dioxide emissions you can fix that carbon and convert it into into chemicals i think that's the way to go about uh, you know uh, I, i i was uh, pleasantly surprised when um, reliance said that they are going to be zero carbon company by 2035 if those in fossil fuel business can do that i think uh, that's the kind of transition not necessarily that we have to go electric vehicles all vehicles should be electric there should be a ban on petrol or diesel i think that's not the way to go about uh, i will say if you can you uh, produce hydrogen from natural gas and use it in fuel cells which are much more energy efficient you will reduce energy consumption the overall co2 emissions will go down while producing hydrogen if you can capture uh, co2 and convert it into fuels and chemicals i think that's the way even for coal coal gasification you can fix that carbon nothing wrong in it that's the way and we should be really evaluating how these changes have to happen not blindly say that we have to go all renewables we have to go uh, for all electric vehicles and there should be a total ban on uh, on coal there should be a total ban on use of oil uh, or natural gas i think that's not the way to go about in my view okay so we will be uh, we will not be able to meet the energy demands of these uh, countries like india uh, or china uh, by renewables alone so we uh you know use continue to use fossil sources coal oil etc and that but we will have to fix carbon that's the that's the key in my view okay uh well said sir you know i think fix carbon is uh, is anyways the underlying uh, underlying theme you know this is the young professionals forum uh, and we were just talking before this started that many of the people during this covid times have probably seen clean skies for the first time in their life you know uh, so you know it's 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 something that they had not imagined before oh uh, yes <laughs> i was telling you before we started this program that uh, in our younger days i am delhi born brought up and we used to see clear skies but also we were not able to only this uh, you know perhaps the rain of the last two days and and this covid could enable us to see blue skies in delhi also and some stars i could see which we used to yeah. see plenty in our younger days so i think that, that's the positive side of covid you know yeah okay. so let me let me take that question to vipul uh, vipul you operate a mixed portfolio i mean you have a coal based portfolio as well as you know you have a renewable portfolio i think while on the oil side the debate rages on in terms of you know oil to electric on the power side do you think that's a settled debate that uh, uh that we may not have coal for a very long period of time and we'll move wholesale to renewable is is that is that a shift that is determined or is that a shift that is still playing out uh yeah hi morning and uh, yeah i think it's a shift that's still playing out uh, uh vishal look uh, first of all thanks for so thanks for having me on uh, i'm seeing the list of participants and it's it's quite quite nice to see so much enthusiasm on this topic Uh, i think one uh, one thing we have to keep in mind uh, is that the transition um, in the energy sector relative to transitions in other industries happens much less fast much, is much slower but relative to the investment cycles or the duration of an investment cycle in the energy cycle in the energy sector it's a very fast transition so if you think about an investment cycle that is 20 30 years and you have a transition happening in 10 15 years that's less than one investment cycle so i think we have to keep that in mind uh but it's important for whatever discussions we have here today or in general on energy transition to take a 10 to 20 year view because unless you're taking that view you can't really impact investment decisions 
and if you look at you know uh, any of the any of the developers or any of the people investing in the sector that's really the investment cycle that they need to need to uh, look at and plus obviously for this particular forum you know with with young professionals uh, a 10 to 20 year time frame is very very relevant for the audience this is this transition will happen in the lifetime of anyone who's who's a young professional now I, uh, there's young at heart and young in body and all that but that's a different issue but anyone who's a young professional will see this transition happen in their lifetime now coming to your question um uh, i think uh with this with a view on this investment cycle let's just look at some just facts right and there's a lot of there's a lot of advocacy that happens for renewables there's a lot of um, sort of uh, defense that happens from the conventional industry we have both so we see sort of both both sides of it but i think a few things are clear i think if you look at uh, you know nameplate uh, conventional capacity in, in the country maybe whatever 300 gigawatts or whatever it is if i look at the power side but the reality is if we have a peak demand of say 180 gigawatts the generation and uh, dispatch sector already creaks and struggles at that number so i've heard many people many very people of my much wiser than me in the industry say look if that peak goes from 180 to 200 the nameplate capacity that we have will not be able to supply it or will really struggle to supply that going from 180 to 200 is barely one to two years of growth and i think what's very clear is that the that viable storage to allow the grid to run for anything other than a very short peak is not going to be there in one to two years yeah considering that renewables is just about getting to 10% of the electricity mix by the way that electricity mix due to electrification is increasing relative to liquids and other things so that my sense is at least for the next 10 to 20 years we are going to be behind the curve racing to create more renewables but still uh struggling to move that needle in terms of percentage of the mix quite a bit so my sense is in short um uh conventional power is here for at least one more investment cycle now there's a different big risk i think we are facing as an energy system in our country which is we are not giving the right investment signals or the right market signals to allow that investment cycle to happen mm. so certainly i can tell you it seems very unlikely that any that many if any private players are going to invest in conventional power i don't yeah. know how many are going to expand refining capacity to take the analogy from from the refinery side yeah. private players so that i think the private sector that is first affected by this has already sort of voting with their feet so the i think we are headed towards quite a um, tricky time where the uncertainty on conventionals is reducing the market signals and therefore investment is drying up very quickly but renewables is not yet ready within this investment cycle to fully take over at that scale or fully sort of meet it yeah. uh, well said vipul i think you know i picked a couple of things and and uh, i want to ask a link question but you know just reacting to what you said one is i think it's a great way to think about it which is an investment cycle which is you know 10 to 20 years uh, and especially from the perspective of the audience of this forum you know we have to answer the equivalent of the question which was asked in graduate right the future is in plastics which apparently inspired mr ambani to to get into uh, get into petrochemicals right so what's the equivalent of that that statement uh, you know for the next one or two investment cycles but let me just take that question to to mahesh uh, you know mahesh your starting point is renewable um, and you know couple of things which which people raised is one uh, are we ready to meet the the challenges of let's say peak demand one and second is an increasing electrification of uh, of of the economy so how do you see that playing out yeah no thanks so shall i think uh, and i was in delhi again uh, this this week and uh, it's a pretty strange scenario for me uh, because you know there is a we were actually lobbying to with mnri not with coal ministry or mop but mnri to allow renewable plus storage uh, opportunity to bid uh, in mnri's bids and can you believe that 
there is another bid that's uh, proposed to happen where it is supposed to blend the coal with renewables uh, to deliver uh, the firm uh, balanced energy uh, form. And we've been saying, why don't we do 100% renewables plus storage? And the, the resistance we're having is pretty amazing that uh, Ministry for Renewables is actually uh, lobbying for coal to be blended with renewables. So we're in a world today where 10 years ago, when the first solar bids happened, uh, you know, coal was asked to subsidize solar to, to be able to find a way to market it. And now Ministry for Renewables is subsidizing coal by blending with solar to find a way to market it, right? So it's a, in 10 year cycle, we went from subsidizing solar to now we're subsidizing coal uh, to find a way to have an offtake uh, for that. So it's pretty interesting uh, lobbying I had to work with, not lobbying, I mean education we had to do uh, at multiple levels. Um, but I guess the, the big question for renewables was obviously, I think on the scale terms and, and the pricing terms was obviously addressed in a two, three years ago. Uh, we were able to you know, decarbonize at, uh, at an, an enormous scale. And of course, we were able to demonstrate renewables is uh, far cheaper than uh, any form of fossil energy, whether it's coal or gas. Um, but I guess in the last year or two, uh, what's clear in, in the data we have that uh, uh, renewables plus storage is already cheaper than coal. And that's now today. I mean, if, if there is somebody willing to offtake, uh, you know, any form of peak power or flexible power without any form of uh, fossil integration, uh, with the same reliability factor uh, coal power will provide. Uh, now for example, this green coal, we can deliver uh, energy at around $60, $60, dollars per megawatt hour uh, without, without uh, you know, with just renewables and storage as a combination. So I think the, the holy grail of the sector was always, can renewables plus storage uh, deliver like-to-like, -like, uh, dispatchable, schedulable, flexible energy, uh, energy packets uh, to the grid. Um, I think the answer is yes. Can we do it now? The answer is yes. Can we do it cheaper than any form of fossil energy? The answer is yes. So it, it is, you know, I know some more data needs to be there to for the market to get more confidence on that. Um, but the, the bigger point is uh, we are here and uh, to look at the uh, there's an Amanari Seki presentation on roadmap to renewables. So they've kind of mapped out the next 10 years that the, the country needs 100 gigawatts of new energy to be added to, this, to the market to meet the, the growing demand. And how do you fulfill that, right? Do you want to go back to coal or do you only focus on renewables? And so we believe that uh, all of the 100 gigawatts can be uh, fulfilled through just renewables. And, in, in various forms, whether it's renewables or hybrid, or or, uh, or the key term is now dispatchable renewables, um, all of that can be addressed directly uh, without having to invest in in coal. And that's our view, and because there is evidence now, there is enough uh, 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 you know experience now in the sector in India. Uh, probably India is far ahead of most OECD markets. And there's a lot of entrepreneurship in India. Uh, unlike most markets, when I look at it, they're largely dominated by a few large utilities. But you know, India is a little bit more uh, more entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial nature in how we're looking at energy. We're not just we're just reliant on two or three big oil companies. You know, another discussion I had with another oil company uh, is that I said there's no value add for these big utilities anymore. You know, it's not investments. Investments are available. Uh, are accessible in many forms today. Uh, it's entrepreneurship in India today who can lead with renewables and, and the new technologies out there uh, and address this, uh, this, this interesting opportunity to decarbonize much faster. And is the choice, you know, I think for the next generation, in my view, uh, it is, uh, it is it'll be unfortunate if you think, you know, we need to because we have coal, we need to find a way to extend their life. I think if all of us focus on uh, the future and bring our entrepreneurial views on and, and capabilities and innovation, I think we are, uh, 
we can just focus on going 100%, the next at least 100 gigawatts target to be renewable plus in any form. Uh, so, Mahesh, that's that's quite interesting, and as I said, just you know, uh, contrasting view uh, from what we heard. Uh, but before I before I come back to you, uh, let me just go to uh, Ms. Shukla on um, on the same question because she is closer to the projects which are happening right now. So, you know, I mean, while we're talking about the future and investments to be made, I, I'm sure you know she's looking at projects which are getting executed right now. Projects are getting financed, discussed. Um, you know. The big, I, I think the question would be, uh, are you seeing a change in the nature of projects that you're doing? And are there projects which facilitate energy transition, you know, whichever side, whether it is coal gasification, biogas, on the refinery side, but uh, real investment trends or projects which, which point towards a change in the scenario. Uh, thank you, Vishal. Uh, good morning. And uh, it's a privilege to be part of the Young Professionals Forum uh, of FIPI. Uh, Dr. Malhotra, very good morning to you. It's great to see you, sir. Uh, Bipul, Mahesh, and uh, I think we have uh, Mr. Jain also on the panel. I cannot see him. Uh, so, uh, Vishal, I, we see it, uh, this energy transition uh, from a newer perspective today. Uh, our journey has been very integral to the growth of the oil and gas sector. However, uh, various changes that have happened, various imperatives that are in place today, uh, kind of mandate that we shift our uh, business models, we shift our uh, uh, you know, the expertise that we have and shift our focus to other areas. Uh, now, why uh, the conviction that we have to do that is uh, coming from the fact, as uh, DGFP mentioned, that there is an aspirational need uh, from the nation. And uh, since the uh, energy demand in, let's say, the next 30 years or so, maybe growing a fourfold kind of number that we see as for the projections, there is room for every form of energy there's room for every kind of feedstock which can go in to meet that demand. Uh, it is up to us how we steer these uh, pathways in terms of uh, uh, you know, incentivizing industry, which is oriented towards more uh, a carbon neutral kind of uh, technology, uh, oriented towards usage of um, recyclable products, recyclable feedstock, and on that subject, the way we see our own involvement is uh, traditionally being uh, in the hydrocarbon industry, there has been huge impetus which has come about in the area of utilization of the biomass and other renewable sources towards production of uh, fuel, which can be blended and other utilizations of uh, uh, you know, uh, other feedstocks like uh, not just the biomass, but uh, tree-based oils, uh, looking at the used cooking oils, all these, uh, you know, uh, initiatives which have been steered, spearheaded by the ministry have are slowly uh, by and by forming a, a framework for project implementation. And I will just share a few projects which are moving in the area of uh, the biorefinery, particularly in the second generation ethanol, one of which we are also involved, uh, the uh, Numaligar, the jo joint venture company, ABRPL's bamboo refinery in the Northeast, and uh, two others are in better uh, advanced stage. One is the Indian Oil's Panipat uh, biorefinery, and the other one is the Burger refinery. And Patinda and others are going to come uh, in due course. So now uh, positioning our expertise, positioning our, uh, or using our core competence to diversify into areas of handling biomass and renewables, this is some additional expertise that a company like ours, an engineering company, design and engineering company, project implementation, 
aspects we have dovetailed. And uh, I'll just take a, a minute to also um, mention that uh, the area of uh, blending a clean coal technology to meet the products, uh, whether it is uh, the synthetic natural gas, whether it is a methanol as a product or petrochemicals. So utilization of the uh, hydrocarbon core competence into conversion technologies using uh, coal as a feedstock is the other area that uh, we are focusing in. So this is just uh, building into a diversification uh, on the uh, basket of uh, technologies, basket of uh, supplementary fuels, supplementary feedstock, as well as end products, which will uh, encompass various forms of feed, uh, leading to self-reliance as much as we can, as well as building up the uh, demand needs in various sectors. Thanks, Mr. Shukla. I think that's interesting. We, we always talk about mostly in terms of, uh, you know, oil to electric and then the transition within the electricity sector itself. But it's, you know, also not, it's good to not lose sight of various other transitions which are, which are taking place uh, and innovations which are happening in, in, in the oil space itself and basically reaching, um, reaching that to other, other route and also I'm assuming, you know, coal gasification being important from, from India's perspective, given the large reserves of coal uh, that we have in the country. Uh, let me take the question to Mahib. Mahib, uh, you know, I mean, you represent the investment community here and I'm sure you get to see a lot more interesting proposals. Um, you know, what do you think are the, are, you know, the, are the real ones, um, you know, where, you know, where you can actually have a sound you know, investment thesis and, and invest money in. Right. Thanks, Vishal. Um, just uh, before I begin, for those who don't know, I represent Eversource Capital, which is the largest climate fund in India. We invest uh, in two primary themes. One is uh, decarbonization of energy, and the other one is resource eff efficiency. On decarbonization, we focus on uh, renewables, e-mobility, energy efficiency, storage. And on uh, resource uh, side of things, we focus on wastewater. So anything which helps the country and customers uh, do more with less. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, while we have investments on the renewable uh, side, uh, I think uh, Vipul and Mahesh have very eloquently talked about that sector. So the sector I would like to highlight over here is the e-mobility sector, which in my view is a very exciting industry. Um, in my view, it is uh, uh, disrupting the oil industry in a similar way that uh, renewables have uh, disrupted the coal industry. So when you look at uh, some of the more advanced markets such as US, you know, where uh, Peabody uh, Coal, which was at one time had 20% uh, plus market share, so the largest coal company, and about three years back, you know, it declared uh, bankruptcy. Uh, so you can see the effect of all of these disruptive technologies and the energy transition which is happening. I think uh, on the e-mobility side, a similar equation is going to play out. Uh, the timing is anyone's guess. I think that's what uh, most of the panelists are saying. Some are saying that it might be faster. Some are saying it might be uh, slower, but it will happen over time. Uh, simply because uh, uh, the costs of all the clean tech side of things is declining fast, whereas on the fossil side, it's staying stable or fluctuating and you, it is all dollarized. So when it comes to INR terms, you know, anyway, it will keep on increasing because of the INR devaluation. Um, one I think which is important to note on e-mobility is uh, unlike renewables, which uh, for a long time till about, you know, two, three years ago was dependent on subsidies. I, in the case of e-mobility, a large part of the use cases, uh, such as uh, delivery vehicles or uh, any commercial use cases, you know, when you take e-auto or commercial fleet of uh, buses, cars, they are already profitable, commercially viable without any subsidies. So that's a very interesting and powerful point. And as a result, uh, I, now you're saying mass scale deployment across the world, and that is catching up in India as well. Um, 
the similar equation i would think would play out on the hydrogen economy side uh, but probably you know over a 5 10 year uh, time horizon um and uh, i for all the companies uh, that will have a big impact for the young professionals who are attending this uh, you know uh, that will have a big impact i uh, everyone should really think about you know what are the areas which uh, will see and benefit from the growth i think for the oil companies uh, they have a lot of assets uh, which can aid in this transition and they can benefit commercially so for instance on the e mobility side you would uh, require a large amount of uh, charging swapping infrastructure to be created uh, you would also need uh, for the utility uh players uh, the opportunity is to actually uh, supply power by creating that overall infrastructure for the traditional auto players uh, a new component value chain would be created so uh, i think every uh, traditional industry should uh, not look at this whole transition as a force which is going to disrupt them but rather you know think about how to adapt and benefit from the transition thanks bhai you you seem to have kicked up a, a storm of questions with with that e mobility queue uh, so you know uh, let me also go off script a bit and then pick that up um, and i'll go back right to dr malhotra uh, so sir uh, you know I, i if if you could react to what mahit was saying you know i mean uh, which is kind of decided shift towards towards e mobility which of course you know uh, impacts a big use case of the the oil industry um, your your thoughts on that i i know in the past we have discussed on on you know other options for uh, for mobility as well so it will be good to know your thoughts on 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 that so you are on mute okay now i can be heard yes okay uh you know this issue of uh, uh, evs and uh, uh disrupting the oil and gas industry which has been talked about in various forums uh, and uh, in fact some of the uh, policy makers also have said that uh, the the oil industry is uh, going to die and uh, you know this will be only electric vehicles and so on and so forth i somehow you know have been trying to examine this issue in depth uh, not because uh, i work for the oil and gas industry don't think from that angle uh, i i've been uh, trying to make an assessment of uh, the issues with electric vehicles you know i i am not against that please uh, don't take me but uh, you know the electric vehicles may be successful for uh, two wheeler side you know in in due course of time because uh, uh people can charge them possibly at home if it is possible as far as uh, mahip was mentioning that the, the the various stakeholders can gain the oil industry can gain by putting charging stations etc i have been telling my some of my oil companies uh, in their retail outlets have been putting charging infrastructure i have been telling them this is not the way to go about for an oil industry people you know you have to be in this business of energy you cannot be earning that kind of revenue by putting up charging stations and allowing where is the space available in india you know you see the crowded retail outlets where people don't have patience to come in and uh, you know wait for even 3 4 minutes to get their car filled and you need uh, you know half an hour to charge your car can you leave it over there at charging stations in retail outlets no so i think the question of uh, allowing the uh, infrastructure of the oil companies for charging vehicles uh, is ruled out a uh, second uh, issue about this electric vehicles is the current status of batteries i don't know what mahesh was talking about you know energy storage if you have other energy storage systems it's perfectly all right but if you are thinking in terms of lithium cobalt batteries i have my own doubts that uh, the the kind of uh, you know lithium and cobalt uh, mines uh, have been taken over by china world over and the kind of environmental and human rights issues in congo if you study those the negative side of uh, of you know 
these batteries based on lithium and cobalt are not going to uh, going to survive so if you uh, really you know uh, want the electric vehicles to survive or the batteries you have to have innovative uh, innovative uh, systems now uh, on the other hand china which uh, was very aggressive and they have lot of lithium and and cobalt mines also under their under their ownership they are now switching over to hydrogen fuel cells you know uh, i am glad mahip did mention that uh, that transition also may happen and hydrogen can also integrate with renewables as well because hydrogen becomes a storage media the efficiency of electrolyzer is going up you know hydrogen can be fueled in minutes like petrol and diesel we are used to you know fueling our cars with natural gas our our energy uh, infrastructure can has switched over from liquid fuels to natural gas it can switch over to hydrogen but i have my doubts it can switch over to electric charging stations you know that's that's not possible for the infrastructure right and coming on to the heavy commercial vehicles one issue which uh, which comes to mind is that are the trucks have to carry the load you know the heavy batteries the i was reading one uh, article where uh, the the toyota ceo has mentioned you know the trucks are mentioned uh, are designed to carry the loads and if you have to electric truck you need you know tons of batteries inside you know the kind of materials you leave aside and batteries cost people say will fall you know i i was reading that article of uh, toyota which they said that the batteries have already scaled you know the cost of materials is going to go up when the demand goes up at 70 to 80% of the cost of the battery is lithium and cobalt which will go up on the other hand the fuel cells the new innovations which are happening are reducing the cost of fuel cells if you can produce hydrogen which is which is being produced in refineries and you can make it available for fuel cells you have double the efficiency of the vehicle twice the efficiency of the internal combustion engines which you have at present uh, it's it will be a game changer so it's time this competition really is going to be between hydrogen fuel cells and electric vehicles i do not know which will win but i am betting for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles not for electric vehicles just for one reason that you know you can be dependent on saudi arabia for oil and natural gas or the middle east and then get the hydrogen out of natural gas or you can be dependent on renewables to produce hydrogen but you cannot be dependent on china for lithium and cobalt the world has been taken over by that and the kind of you know uh, the, the infrastructure which is required over there uh, i think it is it, it, we we need to correct our policies in this direction and if you offer the same kind of subsidies for hydrogen fuel cells today what you are offering for electric vehicles even today some calculations by some of the researchers have shown you have benefit on greenhouse gas emissions through the hydrogen fuel cells and you also uh, uh, unless you have entire electricity coming from renewables which is not going to even in europe you know i was reading a paper of ron harper which they said under the european union energy mix which is predominantly renewables and rest is from fossil sources the hydrogen fuel cells score better in terms of greenhouse gas emissions i think we need to carry out complete life cycle uh, analysis uh, from cradle to grave in terms of emissions in terms of uh, the total uh, you know costs economic and and also the environmental analysis need to be done to set our policies right otherwise we may we may just go in one direction and then find that okay china i am told is reversing its policy in spite of owning cobalt and lithium uh, mines they are now going over for hydrogen fuel cells japan is not touching evs they are going call for uh, hydrogen fuel cells so i think we need to carry out system i have nothing against electric please don't misunderstand me but uh, but i think that country needs to make a correct assessment of what is the root or what as vartika said there may be room for everything let's see uh, the market forces will decide and uh, the uh, you know the environmentalists will also decide what is good for the environment renewables if you can have 100% renewables and then use it in electric vehicles fine but as i said in the beginning in my opening remarks also are we here as vartika said the, the energy demand is going to go up the aspirations of people in country like india are very high the middle class is growing energy demand will continue to grow if can we meet all through renewables if we can do that fine but if we cannot let us make our fossil sources clean as far as the utilization is concerned let us capture carbon 
convert them into carbon free fuels for usage so that we have our clean cities we have better energy efficient ways like fuel cells to use those uh, those uh, fossil sources convert that carbon rather than getting into the atmosphere to chemicals and fuels i think that's the way to go about uh, but anyway uh, i think uh, the future uh, generation is listening the younger professionals are listening and they will have to chart out the route for themselves also i think the innovation ways will have to be found but i again will repeat that we need to carry out systematic life cycle analysis for energy environment and economics okay uh thank you sir i think you know we added the dimension of geopolitics to technology and economic considerations um but i think you know that's an interesting perspective i would like to go back to before before i think you said something in your first response and i looked up the number as well is apart from the transition there is um if you look at the overall energy mix i'm looking at a niti aayog report which says we will go from about 17% through electricity to about 27% which means it displaces other fuels uh, i'm assuming a large part of that mix change is is in the transportation sector but what else do you see apart from mobility is are there other use cases can be converted to electricity as well oh i think it's actually very widespread very widespread and uh, again to reiterate the theme you know the energy sector moves slowly if you look at uh, you know any one quarter or two quarters but if you look at it over a 10 year period it, massive changes happen so let me let me give you some examples right um we've talked about uh, mobility uh, at length so whether it goes down the um, uh, sort of lithium ion route or it goes down eventually to a hydrogen route or some combination or one followed by the other whatever it is what's very clear is that the implications for a refiner are very stark last 200 years or 150 years refineries have been built with the primary focus being auto fuels if that focus has to change towards pet chem and and we are already seeing that Uh, shift already starting to happen i'm sure vartika and the eil folks uh, are living with that every day um, that's a that's a very big shift if you look at uh, and i'm i'm focusing on diesel specifically because it's obviously the biggest piece of the uh, of the of the slate um, you look at gensex 10 years back it was unthinkable that every single factory small business etc would not have a massive equal gensex backup today people are still kind of having but much less and when they are having a genset the running hours are much much less uh so so diesel use in gensets is i suspect declining quite i'm sure the indian oil folks will have the numbers but that's declining quite sharply you look at agricultural pump sets that entire usage has started to move towards uh, distributed solar type of applications and we can all argue ke bhai do saal mein hoga ke 10 saal mein hoga and all but you know, trend once the business in india as as mahesh was saying earlier once the entrepreneurial model is uh, clicks then we have a lot of entrepreneurs in this country it will take off so pump sets will i think in a matter of time get very very substantially shifted trains uh, you know i i i uh, remember uh, being exposed to some of the decisions in the indian railways and there was always a big question about you know uh, diesel locos versus electric locos that's settled it's a matter of time now as to how quickly it goes or how slowly it goes towards electric uh then what's really left is if i go back to dr malhotra's point what's really left is the big bastion of heavy haulage right mm. and uh, uh, that that will be left but what that means is if if let's say i, I don't know what is it uh, diesel is probably about 40% of the refinery slate today if that comes down or if let's say the incremental growth is gone yeah or even the existing 40% somehow comes down to even 30% i'm not saying bring it down hugely that has massive implications for how a refinery investment happens or doesn't happen or gets configured so i do think it uh, th- that's one piece of it um the other thing i think we have to look at quite carefully is 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 the difference between centralized generation and distributed generation and i think you'll see a lot more distributed generation uh, happening Uh, uh in in all sorts of uh, in all sorts of ways i think a third trend that we are seeing i touched upon it earlier is uh we'll see a uh, very sh- quick shifts in where the private sector invests and the the government companies the psus 
for a variety of reasons may still continue to invest or may still have to continue to invest and maybe may be required to get the support to do that but the private sector will move very very fast and and we've seen the private sector move already from conventional uh, i don't know what will happen in hydrogen but but uh, certainly on solids and liquids they're moving away very very quickly uh, and so what that and, the, and then one other thing the new point i want to make is that you know all of this at the end of the day uh, depends on having merchant power markets that operate efficiently that today in my mind is a extremely weak link in our system and that's one area that that has a lot of uh, requirement to fix because and i tell you what i mean because you know the days of long term ppas long term ppa uh, past power purchase agreements are reducing and so those used to underpin the big investments yeah now if that moves to merchant risk if there's a lot of uncertainty in that and there's lack of clarity how you'll get paid no one's going to finance an investment yeah so if we are moving very fast towards more merchant or merchant type markets but we are unclear whether those markets will give returns then to me that represents one of the biggest open questions for the energy system of our country and somewhere in the next one or two years we have to get that that off take okay. and payment system sorted out thanks people i think that's quite insightful i think we are at time we have probably time for two short comments i want to go quickly to mahesh uh, mahesh your uh, i i think you know all the while we've been talking about uh, renewable disrupting coal or taking the space of coal in the country but i think what all the other panelists also said is you know the general electrification trend uh, is there a renewable to refinery uh, you know competition play that that you're thinking about yeah i think clearly uh, there were two trends that happened right uh, i think to look at gas for example you know we probably have about 10 plus gigawatts of gas assets in india stranded not due to lack of access to gas global lng is probably today most competitive so already renewables or renewables plus storage or other forms today so clearly the utilities and the customers are not looking at uh, gas as a long term solution Uh, even if these assets are today you know, offering at a very low fixed price, uh, so clearly there's been that trend that has been uh, overcome. That role for gas in power India is not has no future, uh, and we already have those scenarios today. So renewables has taken over that that scenario. So the two things renewables have done: one is just not giving a long-term inflation protected, uh, you know, kind of uh, pricing. Uh, to the utilities or, or to other to the other customers like industrial customers, and it also has given uh, achieved as uh, the role of gas was largely in the flexibility management of the power sector, and even that role is now getting taken over by renewables or renewables plus storage. And this is storage does not need to be only lithium ion; it could be other forms like uh, it's pumped hydro storage or uh, flow batteries and other forms as well. So, so there's two important shifts already happened. You know. through renewables or renewables plus storage i think on the uh, on the hydrogen side again uh, and i agree with dr malhotra uh, as well that i think that could be india could probably definitely use hydrogen as a, uh, a as a more strategic path uh, instead of only relying on on batteries and precious metals i think again india is blessed with so much natural resources unlike europe and Japan, where hydrogen has a little bit uh, uh, ahead of the curve, that we could look at still delivering green hydrogen, um, economics closer to already uh, grey hydrogen, and if we have to spend capital costs on uh, carbon capture and storage, and that could be used to incentivize green hydrogen uh, today, so that in the next couple of years we're delivering uh, green hydrogen uh, at economics closer to. Green hydrogen, and, uh, and and that could be another decarbonizing solution to the auto industry or other transport market as well. Yeah. So that's uh, Mahesh. You've thrown one more one more dimension into the debate. I think I, I I'm seeing mainstreaming of hydrogen in uh, in in the discussion. Um, but I think you know interesting discussion. We are at time. Uh, so you know I if 
I, I think, Mr. Shukla, there is one question directed at you. If you would want to take uh, uh, that, which is about if you have a view on the changing standards on on fuel, it's on your uh, chat window. Uh, let me just read that out for you. It's um, so the question is, you know. Uh, do we see the possibility of more stringent environmental norms uh, coming into into transportation? Today? Yeah, I see that. Uh, before I get to the question, I think there are a couple of points which can be added on to the discussion. One is, uh, uh, you know, as we have discussed, gas being a kind of a bridging fuel towards a lower carbon economy. And that impetus, uh, which is directed in terms of the percentage increase of gas in the energy mix itself, is a driver. Now, the other thing which uh, recently in terms of uh, the electrical vehicles, which has, you know, I think a week back, there was a, a, a kind of a direction or a policy direction wherein the dissociation of the, uh, primarily for the two-wheelers and three-wheelers, where the dissociation of the vehicle registration and the battery business was, you know, uh, it was delinked. So that kind of uh, interventions based on the market mechanism, the price advantage and uh, what it gives to the consumer. Plus, as uh, Dr. Malhotra mentioned, the availability of uh, a, a competitive, uh, you know, lithium ion battery or lithium cobalt battery that is going to play up into the future of the uh, space of EVs. But what that's going to lead is, uh, actually, if you see, uh, almost 60 to 65% of the gasoline which is consumed in the nation goes towards fueling the two wheelers. So in, on the city level, the uh, de, uh, you know, um, uh, handling pollution, this seems kind of a uh, immediate, in, in near terms or let's say medium terms, some kind of push to do that. But uh, uh, again, as uh, Dr. Malhotra mentioned, that the life cycle analysis, because it doesn't make sense to make uh, electricity in a, a coal-based TPS. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, the only difference is it's a central, it's a, it's a single location emission vis-a-vis uh, distributed emission in the, on the road in the cities. So that kind of a holistic view is definitely needed to see whether it is the EV space or the hydrogen, a cleaner fuel, renewable hydrogen is likely to push things forward. Let me go to the question which is now posed with respect to fuel specifications. Now we are already almost uh, as good as the European standards and the world standards in terms of the uh, specifications. I have seen the question also now. Uh, where we see there may be further shift is increasing, let's say, for example, the RON of the gasoline from 91 to 95. Now that again is a function of the development and the needs of the ICE engines. So while there are some superior engines, the uh, uh, wherein, let's say, largely used in the high-end cars, et cetera, where we need a RON of 95. So it depends on how the, uh, the fleet is in terms of uh, the gasoline market. Diesel, by and large, uh, we don't see much of change beyond BS6. Uh, but the other thing which we must uh, take into account, looking into the uh, fuel products is uh, the requirement or if in future, we have a policy intervention and a mandate to blend renewable fuels in it. And when we see that, that is going to not only impact the quality of fuel, there are already some gazettes and stipulations in terms of the quality of blending of ethanol, biodiesel, methanol, etc. But it would also impact the capacities and the uh, investments in the core uh, refining industry. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's been a very interesting discussion, uh, but we are at time. So, you know, I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, I think there have been debates on a lot of points, but some uh, some things which, you know, hopefully we all agree on. One is the clear trend towards uh, more and more electric use cases. 
um, secondly, uh, the debate still on in terms of whether it's going to be electric or whether it's going to be hydrogen or or some other way of of meeting it. Uh, thirdly, I see you know coming from Mayesh and and also we put to some extent on the increasing confidence on being able to green the upstream part of the electricity uh, value chain, and that that transition from a utility standpoint is happening faster than uh, uh, than than the typical one. And I think Mahib, just a last comment to you. Uh, I'm sure you can look at investment options far beyond e-mobility, as you would have seen a lot of um, other interesting things which got got thrown up as well. um but a big big thank you to to the entire panel i think you've been you've been fabulous i'm sure the the audience enjoyed the conversation we try to answer most of the questions as part of the of the discussion um uh, you know but but really enjoyed the conversation thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you thank you vishal okay thank you thank you vishal